Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good day. Welcome to another module of Blossoms. I am uh, Arshad Slim Bhatti, a professor of physics uh, working at the Comsets Institute of Information Technology. Today's module is about kite flying. Kite flying has been a wonderful sport, particularly it has fascinated me in my childhood when I used to see kites flying in the sky. I always used to wonder how it is possible to fly an object to uh, in the sky. Kite flying since then has become a sport. It is a, a skill, an art, and it's a recreation uh, activity for not only for children, but for elders as well. The history of the kite flying goes back as long as 3000 years, uh, where it is believed that the kite was invented in China simply for the reason because uh, silk was uh, fabricated in China. There are signs of kite flying in um, Far East countries like Malaysia and Indonesia. Since then, uh, the kite flying has become uh, a recreational sport which has introduced kites of different shapes. For example, boxed one, diamond kites, uh, square kites, and winged boxed kites. Uh, as you can see on your screen, a number of different shapes of kites are available. Another dimension to kite flying has uh, been given by these stunt kites, where these kites have got more than one cord to maneuver the kites. You can see with this one, we can do a synchronous kite flying, where a number of kite flying doing uh, maneuvering with the kites uh, in, in the skies. Uh, they can do it because they have uh, much better control over kite flying. I would like to share one historic event with you. When Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia in 1752 used the kite flying experience to prove his hypothesis of thunder electricity, he flew the kite on a very cloudy day into the clouds and transferred the charge from clouds down to earth to prove his hypothesis this was the practical use of kite flying. The flight of a kite is very much similar to flight of an aeroplane. The number of forces uh, uh, being exerted or in, on, on a flight of a plane is almost the same as on the kite. You probably have seen the launch of a kite or the flight of a kite and a plane taking off and then flying in air. Uh, you can very easily determine what are the forces which are being exerted on the plane and also on the kite, if these are similar or dissimilar. We can take a break here. You can discuss these for, uh, the, the forces with your teacher, and we come back, and then we will discuss more about uh, the types of forces which are involved, the reasons for these forces uh, which are acting on a kite and on the plane, which are similar. Uh, the only difference is the magnitude of these forces. Uh, let's have a break and discuss these forces. Welcome back. I'm sure you have uh, rightly identified number of forces acting on the two objects, that is plane and the kite. Let's discuss the case of plane first. Now the plane takes off and gets to the maximum altitude. When it comes to the maximum altitude it can achieve, there are four forces which are involved, is the weight, which is acting downward due to gravity. Then there's a force acting upward known as lift. There's a force acting backward known as uh, the drag. And then there's a force in the forward direction, which is known as thrust, produced by the engines. So these forces are acting on the aeroplane when it is flying. These similar forces are acting on the kite as well. One thing which I have not mentioned and you have noticed is the angle of the launch. It is very important to, to start the flying. Uh, the angle of launch is also known as the attack angle. That is the angle which uh, the plane or the kite makes with the blowing air so that it can feel the lift and the drag both. This is very important and we will go through these later in this lecture. Now, flying of the kite can teach us uh, some bas basic principles of aerodynamics. Now let's define aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is a sub-branch of fluid dynamics and it deals with the dynamics of air when it interacts with solid objects. Let's discuss the force exerted by one object on the other. In case both objects are solid, interaction takes place only at the point of contact of two objects. 
However, the situation is different if one object is solid and the other is liquid or a gas, air for example, or the solid object is moving with certain velocity in the medium or medium has a certain velocity. In this case, interaction will take place on all surfaces exposed to the medium. The medium will exert force on the surface and this pressure depends on the velocity of the either medium if it is moving or of the object if it is moving through the medium. We know that the fluid uh, exerts a force on the object which is submerged into that one. Let's uh, think about an aeroplane wing or a kite when it is uh, flying. Uh, air flow, uh, applies uh, or exerts a pressure on its wings. Can you uh, determine uh, the magnitudes of these pressures on the upper or the lower surfaces of a wing? Uh, how these air patterns would be? I would like you to discuss with uh, your teacher and we come back and we will see how these patterns are, uh, the, the, the pressures on the wing and how the difference of the pressure can result into a, a net force in the upward direction. Welcome back. I'm sure you have discussed uh, airflow patterns around a wing with your teacher and you might have guessed the right answer to the flow patterns being formed by air when a uh, plane is flying in the air. As you can see on your screen, we have two surfaces, the upper surface and the lower surface. It, the plane wing is designed in such a way that the lower surface feels a higher pressure as compared to the upper surface. And the difference between the two pressures actually gives us the lift in the upward direction and the shape of the frontal area of the wing actually results in the drag which is in the opposite direction. The sum of these two forces which results in the aerodynamic force of the wing. Let's define these terms properly now. Lift is the force exerted by the fluid as a result of the difference in pressure, the upper and the lower pressures. Drag force that resists the object motion in the fluid weight of the object acting at the center of gravity downward. Aerodynamic force is the resultant force of the lift and the drag force. And it is always in the upward direction and it is perpendicular to the plane of the object. The drag force is uh, given by a formula, half of uh, CD multiplied by the rho A and V square, where the CD is the drag coefficient which depends on the shape of the object and for various shapes it is determined experimentally in a wind tunnel where we know the Reynolds number which gives uh, us the type of the fluid motion uh, either it's a laminar or it's a turbulent uh, flow. Uh, rho is the density of the medium, A is the frontal area which uh, object is offering to the wind motion and V is the velocity of either uh, the wind or the fluid or V is the velocity of the object moving in any medium. We can use this formula to determine the drag force. On your screen you can see the drag coefficient given for different shapes. It does depend on uh, how much area being offered. The larger area being offered to the wind, the drag coefficient is high. The smaller is the area for uh, the drag coefficient is small. Before taking the break, I would like you to discuss uh, with your teacher if you have ever experienced uh, the drag force being exerted by air on you, uh, if you wanted to move uh, on a windy day, uh, what happens if you move in the direction of the wind and what happens if you uh, move in, in the direction opposite to the wind blowing direction. Uh, what happens if you run on, on a uh, day where you, there's a light breeze going on? Uh, you can still feel the effect of drag and we will discuss once we are back from after the break. Welcome back, as you have discussed. On a windy day, if we move in the direction uh, to in the direction of the wind, wind can help us move faster. But if we move in the opposite direction to the wind, we have to work really hard to move uh, against the wind. 
and this is actually the drag force which is being uh, exerted by air on our body. If we are of uh, larger size, then this drag force will be large, and we have to do a lot of effort to move in the uh, in in the direction opposite to the wind. Uh, any of you who have uh, flown, they they might have seen on in, in the aeroplanes. Then sometimes the data is given of about the headwind and the tailwind uh, with which velocity it is uh, moving. The headwind always opposes. Uh, or offers a resistance to the plane's motion in the forward direction, while the tailwind actually helps the plane to uh, move in its uh, original direction. Now, we, we have uh, seen the forces uh, being exerted on a uh, kite or on any flying object like aeroplane. Uh, let's come back to the uh, point of discussion. Can we measure the aerodynamic force? Uh, which is the resultant of lift and drag uh, uh, due to the velocity uh, of wind. How we can measure the force? Uh, very simple. I can measure the force using a uh, spring, and you have done this uh, in your high school. Uh, you, can, you can use spring to measure the weight. I have spring balance with me, which actually, which is a cal calibrated spring balance, and I can measure the weights or the forces being exerted uh, in order to extend this spring. Let's do a simple uh, experiment. I've got a book here placed on the table and I use this spring balance to find out how much force will this book require to move. If you look carefully, uh, as I pull this, the spring is being extended before the book starts moving and then book starts moving, but the spring goes a little bit back. With this, spring balance, I can determine how much force I applied uh, on the book which was static before motion and then started moving and how much force I still need to keep that book moving. This is, this is uh, from, from this experiment, I can measure the frictional force which is uh, the result of the two interfaces, uh, uh, the forces existing at the, uh, at the interface of book and the table. Uh, can you identify why these two, the numbers were different? Of, uh, in the first case, when the book just started moving, uh, the force was small as compared to the force which I needed to move this book. Now, why these uh, two numbers are different? Uh, first, in the case when the book was stationary and second, uh, when it was moving, I would like you to discuss uh, with your teacher. This is a case of... Uh, uh, two different frictions involved, uh, one in the static and one in the uh, moving or in the dynamic state. Now, before we take the break, I would like you to do another ex exercise and please take any spring and uh, you can determine the spring constant. We know from the Hooke's law, the extension in the spring is directly proportional to the force being applied on the spring. In our case, it's the weight. I would like you to do one experiment. Uh, I have made a homemade experiment uh, where I have a scale uh, which can measure the extension in the spring. Uh, I, I can put weights uh, to, these, uh, to this spring and I can measure the extension in the spring. I would like you to plot a graph between the extension of the spring and the weight attached to it. And then you will see that it will be a straight line. Uh, from the straight line, uh, the slope of the straight line, you can determine the spring constant. Uh, I, let's uh, do this exercise and we come back and uh, discuss more about this one. Welcome back. In the last segment, you, have, you were supposed to do, discuss two things with uh, your teacher. First was uh, the motion of the book, uh, why it, it needed more force to move, and once it was in the motion, why it, uh, uh, it needed less uh, force. Uh, that is a perfect case of uh, two different frictions. One is the static friction, uh, which is uh, uh, what, what due to its the state of rest the force needed to change its inertia from rest to the motion. We can split friction in two parts. One is the static friction and the other one is the kinetic friction, which was 
smaller than uh, the static friction. So static friction is always higher than kinetic friction. In the second assignment, you uh, you did uh, uh, you verified the Hooke's law for a spring where you plotted the weight as a function of uh, extension, and you got straight line. And from the slope of the straight line, you found a spring constant of the spring. Now this spring constant uh, can be different if uh, you have uh, di different diameters of the spring. You can do this experiment, uh, but it remains the same for uh, the same spring. Uh, it changes if the diameter or the material uh, of the spring changes. Now coming to the next uh, point, uh, uh, next topic, which is uh, the coplanar forces. I have one uh, diagram showing you in which heavy log is being lifted by a crane where it uses uh, uh, two strings which is attached to the ends of the heavy log and being lifted by the third one. Now there are three forces in terms of tensions involved. Tension one in the one string, tension two in the two and T3 is the tension which is the sum of the T1 and T2 and T3 is equal to its weight. Now this is a perfect example of a coplanar forces. Coplanar forces are the forces which act in a single plane. The number of forces are two or more. And uh, why we needed to know about coplanar forces? I have a simple uh, experiment for you where what I have done is uh, I have uh, attached two springs to this table and I want to lift this uh, uh, pencil. And, and I want to see uh, what happens if I change the length of the one string uh, as compared to the other one, uh, how much springs uh, are being extended. Now, if I hold in such a way that the length of the two branches is equal, the magnitude of extension in the spring is the same. But what happens if I uh, change the length such that the front one and the left one becomes a smaller one and the back one uh, or the right one, uh, the shorter one. You can see the extension in the spring uh, of the left one is uh, large as compared to uh, the right one. And if similarly, if I change this one uh, in the other direction, I can observe the same thing. Now this has got something to do with the kite flying. Uh, in the kites which we have in our region uh, is a single cord uh, uh, kite and we need to have tie, make, uh, uh, tie the strings to uh, the kite in such a way that it makes a bridle. Uh, now this is a bridle where we attach uh, one end to the upper part of the kite and this is the back part of the kite and we make this bridle uh, uh, knot uh, over here where the string is being attached. Now this is very important, the length of the two strings because it is going to define the launch angle of the kite. Now what does it mean the launch angle? If I have this string smaller, you can see that this is uh, extended more and now the pencil is uh, a bit higher on, on this side as compared to this one. Now if the air is blowing like that, now it is going to define which surface of the kite, either the, this one or this one, going to have higher or lower pressures. So in this, in this, the way, the way I am holding this pencil, uh, we will have a higher pressure surface uh, will be this one, and the low pressure surface will be this one, and this will make a kite to fly if this one is the top uh, side of the kite. Now we have done some recordings. Uh, uh, out, outdoor recordings uh, of these cases which I have just discussed with you with different strings. Let's have a look at those ones and then we come back and we will discuss why in one case the kite flew or in the other case it flew even higher and then in one case uh, uh, it could not fly. The best season for kite flying is sometimes in February and March where the whole sky is uh, full of kites and it's uh, celebrating the change of season from winter to spring. Now what I'm going to demonstrate how the length of the two strings going to affect the uh, flying of this kite. What happens if I have uh, these two strings uh, of equal length or this one smaller than this one 
uh, the back one or the front string uh, larger than the uh, back string it is going to affect the angles which it is making with the main chord uh, we, we can have three different cases where these two angles are the same or this angle is smaller than this angle or this angle is greater than this angle which is making to the uh, to the length of this chord okay let's do it the kite has started flying and it's it's very stable it seems to be very stable and it is being dragged by air i can do all kinds of maneuvering with it by pulling the strings here and there i make i can make it cycle i can hold the string and then it goes up now you see the kite is being flown okay we have now the second case in this one the length of the front cord is too too short as compared to the back cord this one has gone higher much quickly and if i pull the string it will go even further higher and right on top of me so here the lengths of the cords are quite different the front one is very short as compared to the back one so that's why it's going up much rapidly to the skies now my colleague is going to try the third case when the back cord is smaller than the fr front cord and let's see if he can is able to fly it why he is not been able to fly this kite despite trying for the many times the length of the back cord is smaller than the length of the front cord which makes the angle of the back cord is smaller than the angle of the front cord and you can you can resolve these tensions in the three strings the main cord and the two branches and you can see which where is the net direction of force going which is actually pulling it down against the air drag Welcome back. You have seen, and uh, you have. I'm sure you have observed the right. Why in in some cases the kite could not fly, and in some cases it flew very well. Uh, let me explain it to you once again. We have seen. Uh, I have a, I have a bridle attached to this kite. Uh, now, if I what happens if I have the length of the two cords uh, the same? Uh, what happens is if I uh, make it upward. uh right it does not make any angle uh with the with the wind so it, there is no launching angle so the force is uh acting uh there's there's only drag which is uh, taking this kite away which i can feel in the tension uh of the string but there is no lift available because the kite does not make any angle with the wind but if if i if i shorten this length and i pull these strings a uh, pi bridle like and see this now this kite is making an ang angle with uh, blowing uh, wind now it has not only it has got drag force acting on it but it has got a lift upward lift as well because now it has got a higher pressure area downward and a low pressure area upward which makes it up and in the third case uh, now the kite is like that and it is never going to fly because all the high pressure areas on the upper surface and the lower surface is low 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 pressure area and the fly and the kite goes down now this is this is how critical this is to have this uh, uh, bridle attached and how uh, it is how much important this is to have the lens of the two do two branches of the bridle to have right in order to make this kite fly we have made uh, an instrument uh, to measure the tension in the string as a result of uh, the drag force uh, being applied on the kite due to blowing air or wind uh, this is very simple uh, instrument uh, setup you can make in your home or in the lab i've used a calibrated string and a pulley and then i attached uh, this 
to the other, the string to the other end of the kite. And I flew, when the kite was flying, I left it alone and I measured the readings on, on the scale as the kite was flying. We have done some recording uh, and we have measured, we were fortunate enough or lucky enough that we could uh, measure displacement in the spring as a result of uh, the drag force applied on, the, on a flying kite. Uh, so you have seen uh, the flying kite and then you have seen the spring being extended as the fly kite was flying. We noted these values and uh, uh, we determined the wind velocity uh, using the drag force equation. The values which we used, the drag coefficient for kite uh, shape is 0 0.9. Rho, which is air density, was 1.644 at 30 degrees Celsius which was the temperature of the, that day. We had used the area of the kite, which was 0.212 meter square. As you noticed, the spring showed a variation in the range of two to three newtons. From here, we determined the wind velocity, which came out to be in the range from 3.5 to 4.4 meters per second. Very important is the air density, which is a strong function of temperature. Before you want to do calculations, you need to know the air density uh, on, on, on the particular day and you need to know the temperature. Uh, you cannot take uh, the value of air, uh, randomly the value of air density. Uh, it is a very strong function of temperature. So you must know the temperature uh, out there and then find out the air density uh, as a function. In this module, we learned about the basic principles of aerodynamics. Uh, on any flying object, we learned about the forces which were exerted on, uh, on the object by the medium, uh, the aerodynamic forces which is a resultant of uh, the lift and the drag. And we knew that the drag force uh, uh, is, uh, is dependent on the shape of the uh, object and it also uh, depends and the lift uh, which is a force in the upward direction uh, depends on the differential of the pressures on uh, uh, different faces uh, on the surfaces of the object. In this module, we also did uh, uh, use the springs. We determined the spring constant. We used the spring to determine the force. Uh, particularly in the end, the, the force being exerted on, on a kite uh, by air uh, was determined uh, by using the spring. And then we used a formula uh, of the drag force to determine the velocity of the uh, wind. Before we end, I would like you to think about, about more uh, examples where uh, one, one experiences the drag force of air. For example, ice skater uh, skating at a very high speed. The posture of the skater is uh, to avoid the drag offered by the air when it's moving at such a high speed. Before uh, I go away, I would like to share you that kite flying is like a uh, is is a passion in my part of the world uh, that is in Pakistan, and we celebrate uh, a, a festival known as Basant, uh, usually in in mid of February or end of February, which marks the end of uh, one season and the start of the another season that is from winter to spring, and at, at during those days the whole sky is full of uh, colorful skies. People uh, celebrate by uh, flying the kites, by fighting the kites uh, in the sky. It's a wonderful scene to be observed. I hope sometime uh, you can uh, visit Pakistan and see the, this festival. Thank you very much. This segment is for teacher. Uh, I'll, I would like to uh, discuss few things which a teacher sh uh, should, be a, uh, should be able to discuss with students, uh, which have got uh, more details and more examples for teacher to help uh, in uh, discussing with students. Uh, we started with the number of forces uh, being exerted in a medium on uh, on a solid object uh, like uh, a plane or a kite, uh, these these and then we we had we wanted students to make a free body diagram. 
Now, free body diagram is a very simple way of identifying the forces and their directions. It, it helps students to uh, find out the number of forces being exerted on, on a body uh, and then uh, resolve them into components to and find out the resultant or the net force being exerted on the, on the body. I would like you to uh, give more examples to students to draw the free body diagram, for example, a book resting on a table, uh, very, one of the simplest example where we have only two forces involved, one gravity, uh, one weight uh, of the book due to gravity and the other one is the reaction which is normal to the, uh, uh, to the book uh, in the upward direction. Uh, we can have a, a, an object stationary resting on an inclined plane, uh, there we can, uh, uh, we can also make a free body diagram. This will help students to understand more about the forces uh, and how to resolve those forces uh, and how to determine the net uh, resultant force uh, if there is a, a motion. If there is a motion, then Newton's second law uh, can be applied to determine the acceleration of that object once we know the sum of all the forces. Uh, in the next, uh, we have, uh, we did, what we did is, we use the springs to determine the uh, force ex exerted on uh, somebody. We started with the book and then we proved the Hooke's law and then finally we used the spring balance to determine the drag force. Uh, I would like you to suggest to students to uh, design some simple experiments. For example, if you have, uh, if we have a fan, a pedestal fan uh, with variable speed, we can uh, make, uh, we can have a plane uh, which can, we can expose to this, uh, uh, to, to the fan and we can determine uh, by the extension in the spring uh, how much force is being ex exerted on the plane. We can change the size of the plane, we can change uh, 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 and to deter, and we can look at the effect of the area on on the force being applied on the uh, on, on that uh, plane. Now, finally, we we discussed uh, what happens uh, to the flow patterns of uh, air if we have different shaped objects. I'm showing you a slide where different shaped objects are being placed in a blowing wind or in a wind with having certain velocity. You can see the wind patterns formed due to these objects are different. We move from a, a laminar flow to a turbulent flow uh, where the Reynolds numbers change. I would like you to discuss with students what is a laminar flow or a turbulence free flow and what is a turbulent flow and how it helps uh, in uh, uh, flying the plane or in uh, kite flying. One more thing which I did not mention and uh, or if I mentioned very briefly that it's not only the, the pressure difference which makes the uh, planes fly. Newton's third law uh, also takes place there. Uh, what happens, we have uh, wings uh, uh, having certain angle of attack angle or the launch angle. So when the wind comes in, it strikes, it changes the direction. So when it changes the direction, goes down, as a result, it pushes the aer aeroplane upward. Now, so it's uh, the difference in the uh, pressures of the lower surface and the upper surface and Newton's third law, which is the combination, uh, uh, which is uh, due to the change of direction of the wind, uh, which makes the aeroplane fly uh, that uh, you should, uh, this, uh, you can explain more to the students once this module is over. Finally, I'm showing you a complete free body diagram of uh, a kite where different forces are identified which are acting on the kite. You can see those forces are the aerodynamic force which is the resultant of lift and the drag. Uh, there's a center of gravity one point which I have not uh, discussed, uh, which may be a bit complex, was the center of pressure. If you like, you can discuss with the students. I'll come back to it later on. We have got bridle point, and then there's a very important angle of the bridle point with the line. 
the tension in the string, uh, which uh, is the result of the drag being or the aerodynamic force being applied on the kite. Now, center of pressure is very much similar to the center of gravity. When we have a, a mass distributed in a certain volume, we determine the center of gravity where effectively the weight of the body lies. The similar is the situation when we have uh, a body submerged in, in a medium, in a fluid or in air, then uh, the pressure by the medium is exerted on all the surfaces. So this is, center of point is the point where uh, one can feel the pressure of the medium uh, uh, on, the, on the object. So these, these were the points which I would have liked you to discuss uh, uh, with students. Finally, I, I give you two examples. Uh, if kite flying is not available, uh, you can use the frisbee. Frisbee works on the same principle. If we throw a frisbee, a rotating, a spinning frisbee, it creates a pressure difference. We have got a lower pressure on the upper surface and a higher pressure on the lower surface, which makes frisbee to fly. And of course, when we launch the frisbee, we can also control its launching angle and we can define how high it can go, either against the wind or in the wind. This can be a perfect example, and I'm sure in this example, we, can, we have a control over the uh, launch angle of the frisbee as well. Another example, which is a very good example of the drag force, is the raindrop. The raindrop, let's assume, of a few tens of grams falling uh, from uh, around a few kilometers, let's say two to three kilometers, uh, from the sky when it comes down, it can have a huge impact. But what happens is that as it starts falling down, there is a drag force or the air resistance which acts against its uh, motion, downward motion. And at one point, this drag force becomes equal to the weight. And at that point, uh, the acceleration, the value of acceleration goes to zero. And now at that point, it reaches its terminal velocity and it cannot go beyond this velocity. And that saves us from that huge impact or collision which it can make uh, if there is no drag force acting on it. One more example which is very interesting is of skydivers. Uh, when skydivers, uh, they do some uh, maneuvering in the sky while they have dived from the plane, they would like to have as, mu as much as area, frontal area exposed to uh, to when they are exposed when they are falling so that they can get to the terminal velocity as early as possible. This is, this was, uh, this is another example of uh, the drag uh, which uh, the skydivers were facing. I hope this uh, module was quite interesting for students uh, and they have learned uh, and I have given you some more examples which you can share with students and uh, in detail. Thank you.